Thank you very much for coming. Um, so welcome to this live talk on race, racism and whiteness. There'll be a presentation by Dr. Rima Saini, lecturer in sociology, and Dr. Kasia Narkovic, a lecturer in criminology. During the presentation, feel free to ask questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. Um, you can ask questions throughout or save them for the end, um, but we'll try and do our best to get to as many as possible. Um, so that's pretty much it for the introduction. Um, feel free to ask questions. If you have any troubles, you can put your issues um, within the Q&A as well. Um, so now I'll pass over to Rima and Kasia. Hi, Andre. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, I am uh, just going to present some, um, sorry, technical difficulties at home. <laughs> I say technical dif husband difficulties. Um, so sorry about that. Um, so I'm just going to present um, some teaching and learning plans, first of all, for our department, which is the Department of Criminology and Sociology at um, Middlesex University. And we are within the School of Law. Um, and so we offer undergraduate programs, as you know, across criminology and across sociology. And the larger school offers programs in politics um, and law. Um, what I'm going to do is just share my screen with you and I'll go through some of the um, highlights, university wide and departmental specific highlights of teaching and learning that we hope um, will carry on or start fresh from um, September. So let me just share my screen. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. It's a nod from Kasia, excellent. So as I said, we are embedded in the Department of Criminology and Sociology, okay? So at MDX, um, there are lots of different um, kind of great features of the way that um, obviously in pre-pandemic times, but especially within um, post-pandemic times, we have been um, managing activities, um, learning assessments, feedbacks, and blended learning, which essentially means online um, learning and on-campus learning to give you the best experience that you can have. We've been improving on this year and year, um, and hopefully, when you guys join us in September, you'll be joining um, a, a really kind of well honed um, kind of system of learning and teaching. So in uh, relation to feedback, so based on feedback and we gather informal and formal feedback from students and from other staff members at various points during the year, we have designed and are designing activities um, that worked best for students last year, had the most engagement and helped students demonstrate their learning. We're building lots of innovative new activities as well. So alongside sort of video lectures, we've been doing online and in-person debates. Um, some of uh, the assessments um, are sort of uh, kind of really, really interesting, um, doing videos, doing podcasts, doing online debates and online conversations, as well as your more traditional for those who like writing and reading, essays and reports. Um, in terms of the online and the versus the on-campus delivery of teaching, online delivery is planned for um, larger lectures mainly. Um, so that means we will, for those larger modules, those group modules where sociology and criminology students might be combined, we'll have pre-recorded lectures um, and we'll be having on campus. So that's the tentative plan, but this is all subject to change depending on government advice with um, seminars on campus for you to sort of build a sense of community, to get to know each other and us in person, but to have those large lectures and all of that important information for you pre-recorded for you to access in your own time and watch in your own time. And we've done our best this year and last year to make the timetables work for our students, even in these really difficult times. Um, and in the vast majority of cases we've managed to do that and work with students to make sure that timetabling works for them. 
So as you probably have guessed, all of our learning has been and will be enhanced by technology. Um, and as I said before, we've really honed those online systems to make them work for you. Um, you'll have flexible online access to course materials, to learning resources, to videos and podcasts. And as well as I said before, in your assignments, you'll be creating videos and podcasts as well. Virtual support from academics, so what we call online or virtual office hours, um, and help from other students, so opportunities for you both in person and online to work um, with your friends and with your colleagues and to get that peer support and to work collaboratively on group projects as well. And in terms of assessments, um, the tasks will help you to apply what you know, essentially. And we have uh, engineered them in a way to help reflect the real world. So although there will be your traditional set of assignments and essays um, and reports, you'll also have sort of more interesting, more novel types of assignments. Um, and you'll be assessed through a range of these different types of assignments. So portfolio work, more creative work, coursework, um, and exams as well in some cases. So whatever type of learning works best for you, whatever you like, there'll always be an assignment um, to, to work for you essentially. Um, and you will at second and third year of your undergraduate degree have a, a choice of modules to choose from as well as that independent dissertation project um, that you can uh, essentially research pretty much anything you want in the field of sociology and criminology. Um, and pretty much in any way you want. In terms of our de department highlights, so our department itself, um, as I said before, seminars um, and what we call sort of more interactive workshops, what we also call laboratory sessions or lab sessions, which is usually computer work, um, are planned to be held on campus from September, subject to change, as I said before. Um, and we will schedule those to reflect students' preferences uh, of when they're able and who's able to come on campus. And as I said, lectures on large modules will be delivered online. And we'll also make some seminars available online, online for students who are unable or unwilling to attend on campus. Um, and as I said before, we've got all sorts of learning materials um, that we prepare as a department, um, pre-recorded videos on key concepts and assignment tasks. So if you miss a seminar or a workshop that's geared towards preparing you for an assignment, you'll have all of that information pre-recorded on um, online for you to access. Um, there'll be lecture slides, so there'll be written as well as recorded information and guidance on assignments. So there'll be opportunities for you to study on your own and in your own time and access that information on your own and in your own time, as well as within um, collaborative group, in-person exciting spaces. Okay, but again, this is all subject to change. And we've got a really nice quote at the top here from one of our third year students um, about um, how the online learning experience has actually been really, really nice for some people. OK, um, so they say, I think the students actually engage more in class via Zoom than they normally did on campus. I was a bit concerned at first that our grades might be affected by all this online learning, but it turns out I've actually enjoyed it and it feels nice to take part in a Zoom meeting in the comfort of your own home wearing pyjamas, which I think we all appreciate. So just a short overview of start of term plans. As I said, we essentially going to be following all government advice over the coming months. And so the best case scenario is essentially that we'll have all of those small group activities online and the larger um, group lectures recorded, pre-recorded. Um, make sure that you just keep in touch with whoever you've been liaising with at the university and you keep checking online on the MDX website for more information about what's going to happen. But we've got two plans essentially for the start of term with or without social distancing in place. And both of those are essentially going to give you more in-person teaching that I'm seeing in a long time and a really great learning experience. If you are an overseas student and you've got travel restrictions to the UK, we're going to aim to um, start your course and give you support to learn online until you're allowed to travel. So again, do not worry too much about that. OK, and if you've got any questions or concerns, do get in touch with whoever you've been liaising with so far at the university. OK, we really obviously value international students coming and joining us for all of our programs, including undergrad and postgrad. Um, 
So uh, please do sort of keep in touch with us about that. Okay, so I think that's it for now on the procedural stuff. So I'm just going to stop Great. sharing. Thanks so much, Rima. So if anybody has questions about any of this, please pop it in the Q&A and we can answer it when we finish our conversation. And so just to um, tell you how we're going to run this, me and Rima are basically going to have a little chat um, when we talk about race, racism and whiteness. And these topics have obviously come to the fore recently you know, in the context of the murder of George Floyd. But these are things that we have worked on for a long time. And at Middlesex, um, we are both lecturers and actually we co-lead a module, um, a new module that is called Race and Social Justice. So if you start with us, you will be taught by us uh, on this topic. And so there's a little taster maybe of how it will look. And so what we're gonna start with is, um, is talking about race, right? Because we talk about racism, but what is actually race? Like, how do we understand it? Is it relevant? What is it? Rima, can you start us off? Yes, good question. What is race? Okay. Um, sometimes it's uh, described in scare quotes, so inverted commas, sometimes it's not. Um, we talk about race um, and we differentiate it from other terms or concepts such as racism, such as racialization. We also talk about things like racial supremacy, racial hierarchy. These are all terms and concepts that we'll learn about and we'll learn how to wield them and how to write about them um, during our degree, pro you will, during your degree programs with me and Kasia. Um, so if we're thinking about race, we need to think essentially about colonialism. But the idea of racial and ethnic difference does go way back even pre-colonialism. Um, so race was essentially used to refer to the descendants of common ancestors, um, but it was essentially codified. So what I mean is that these categories or ideas of race were created uh, during colonialism in order to organize labor in the colonies. So when we're thinking about colonialism, we're thinking about, for example, um, the uh, colonies that were set up in the South Asian subcontinent, in the African continent, for example, by um, Western European powers. So by Britain, by France, by Italy, um, by the Dutch, um, by Germany. Um, and these uh, colonial powers created these sort of arbitrary hierarchies of groups based on racial colonial categories. And they drew on ideas around color, which they themselves created. They also drew on ideas around caste, particularly within the South Asian subcontinent, so in India and Pakistan, um, or what was then essentially uh, kind of known as Hindustan. Um, and this sort of codification or this categorization of race essentially seeped into not just the labor systems, but the legal systems, the criminal justice systems, um, even past colonial times. So I would say around the mid 1900s was when these colonies started gaining independence, when this whole colonial structure and colonial empires began to fall, began to dissipate. But these ideas of race still stayed with us. The basis of ideas about there being differences and specifically hierarchies between race was through um, what we call eugenics. And you've probably heard about the term eugenics through um, sort of uh, the Holocaust and what you've probably learned about the history of the Nazis in the 1940s and the 1930s. Um, and this was essentially um, a faux or a false or what we might call a pseudo um, scientific justification for there being differences between races based on physical attributes, emotional and intellectual attributes. We now know that there are no biological difference between races today. And we think about and talk about races, particularly within the social sciences as a social construct. But the effects of race, the language of race, or what we might call the discourse of race still uh, is with us today. And that's because racialization and racism are still key factors in our everyday lives, particularly for those of us who are ethnic minorities and who live within multicultural Western societies, such as the UK, for example. Okay. Um, we have to think then, I guess, beyond race to think of the implications of uh, these uh, 
long-standing and historically embedded hierarchies of difference and hierarchies of supremacies when we actually need to understand why um, differences in what people might just call color so superficial skin deep differences are still so important in today's life Okay, so we tend to talk about race in the context of racism, racialization, and as I said before, racial supremacy and hierarchy today. And um, this is where ideas of whiteness come in as well. So yeah. Kasha, I don't know whether you want to take over or whether you want me to talk a little yeah. bit more about that. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you soon to take some examples, um, but just to sort of say a little bit more about racism. So like Rima was saying, right, like we you know, the differences, um, racial differences don't exist. So we talk about it as a social construct, meaning it's constructed. So if it doesn't exist, you know, why do we still keep talking about it? And as she said, you know, these, this is because these hierarchies, these differences that were established, um, even though we might recognize that they are based on sort of flawless science and, you know, eugenics and racism and all of that, actually these things are mobilized still. Right. And they might be mobilized in different ways in the sense that, OK, we don't have slavery anymore or we don't have um, you know, laws that segregate white people with uh, people of color in the law. But actually, the way that people live their lives is very much structured along those racial lines. So people who are uh, minority ethnic have different outcomes. Right. And we will like, give you some examples uh, in, in a minute. But that's why we study race and racism, because actually uh, it still matters for people or it still matters for their outcome when it comes to health outcomes, you know, like uh, black women are more likely to die in childbirth, for example, right? Or like your um, education outcomes, your housing, you know, social deprivation, all of these kind of things. Um, so, so it's worth also to point out that, you know, even though, um, there are these hierarchies where whiteness is at the top. We, we talk about racism as a so-called floating signifier. And it's okay if you've never heard this concept, we're gonna talk you through it um, uh, later when you start and do the course with us. But what it basically means is that it's not something that is fixed. So some groups that um, were considered white might shift into being considered non-white and thus oppressed. So uh, an example is, for example, uh, Jewish people who were racialized, which means that, you know, there were racial categories attached to them. And from there on, their oppression and the genocide against them was justified, right? And other, other groups are um, Roma Gypsy people or even Eastern Europeans, right? So, so this is the way we think about racialization um, as well, that it can, it can get attached to different people. Um, and that's when, you know, categories are like racial categories get attached and people are often, and these cat these are often negative categories, right? So it's, so it's talking about people in a racialized way. It, it attaches to the negative um, characteristics to them. Um, yeah. Do we want to take some, Rima, some concrete examples like of... Yeah. Totally. And, and as Kasha said, um, when we're thinking about racism, we have to think sort of beyond what we might think of as overt acts of, of racism. You know, the sorts of hate crimes that you see on the street are prevalent and they are actually rising. But uh, racism works in a number of other ways, institutionally, structurally, um, and in the way that certain negative characteristics as Kasha said, are ascribed onto people's bodies and they change the way that institutions, authorities and individuals think and act about them. So one example is uh, stop and search. OK, so stop and search is essentially when um, the police will do random checks um, on individuals at, say, tube stations or train stations to check for any sorts of weapons that they might have. Um, so uh, there are official statistics out there um, which uh, essentially will um, show you uh, exactly how uh, more likely it is uh, for those of certain racial backgrounds to be stopped and searched than others, particularly within certain regions within the UK. So I'll just share my screen with you and I'll show you one example. OK, so this is from um, The Independent. Um, and as you can see here, this, these are two color-coded maps. So on the, less, on the left, 
sorry, this isn't stop and search. This is the arrest rate. Where are my stop and search figures? It should be here somewhere. Sorry, I've lost my stop and search. Oh, here they stop and search there. figures. Okay. So, sorry, this other one was arrest rates, but these are my stop and search figures. So, this is also from the independent. Okay. So, this is data ending March 2019. Um, so, fairly recent, um, but I'm sure there's more up to date figures out there so we can see whether the situation is getting worse or getting better. But what you can see here in the red, it's proportions of stop and search rates by ethnic group and on the right it's um, actual whole figures. So this is really important because what this shows you essentially is that for um, black African or black Caribbean people, the actual number of stop and search rates is lower than those who are white or of white British background, but the proportion of those who are stopped in search or what we might call the rate is so much higher. And you can see how much higher it is for black people than for those who are racialized as white. It's fairly high for some other ethnic groups as well, but you can see how the criminalization and the racialization of black people is embodied through these differential stop and search rates. There are other examples for ex uh, to do with employment as well. So this is from annual population survey data, which you can find re really easily online. Um, and this chart shows you the percentage of economically active people unemployed by ethnicity from 2004 to 2018. Um, and so you can see here that the unemployment rate has consistently been higher over this time for Asian people and for black people. Um, there are commentators out there, there are public figures out there who will attribute this to all sorts of other factors apart from racism and racialization. But the fact of the matter is that discrimination plays such a huge over and covert part of our society that you cannot purely see statistics and figures like this and hear about people's lived experiences without understanding that racism is such an integral part uh, of their experiences of oppression, of exclusion, of inequality. And there are numerous other empirical examples as well to do with um, kind of universities as well, with awarding gaps, to do with home ownership and renting. So for example, 37% of Black Caribbean um, Black Caribbeans own their own home um, compared to 68% of white British people. So this is a function of, you know, the intersection between racisms and economic exclusions and economic inequality. And again, there are all sorts of other factors caught up in here as well. There are plenty of studies, lots of studies that are still going on um, about how you can send off your CV the same CV with a white British sounding name and with say an Asian sounding name, and you'll get different numbers of invitations to interview for that particular job. But Rima, then that is challenged, isn't it? Because because people then say, you know, we live in a so-called post-racial time. You know, we had a, you know, US had a black president, so that means we are post-race. Post means, you know, after, so we are kind of after that time, mm -hmm. like we have moved on, right? So this is not a problem. And so what happens then is all those things that Rima was talking about, people say, oh, but it's down to individuals, you know, it, they are just not trying hard enough. And then uh, they're saying, you know, of course there's still racism, but it comes down to some few individuals that are racist. While when we, when we teach in sociology and criminology about racism, we largely as an academic community agree that actually this is an institutional structural issue. So it is not just, you know, some people that might be racist and everything is fine. Actually, just it manifests itself in different way, racism now than maybe 100 years ago. But we still believe that it is an institutional thing, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, I would say to your question of, or, or the question that is asked, you know, do we live in a post-racial society? Are we beyond that? Um, we can think about the ways that racism manifests itself in, in, in different ways now. Um, we can talk about sort of the fear of the foreigner, the fear of the migrant. Um, we can talk about ideas that we have, dinner table talk, we call it, about how some groups, some people are just incompatible with a Western way of living. Um, we talk about microaggressions now, which is actually is a really useful way of understanding all of those little niggling exclusions and discomforts that a lot of uh, ethnic minority people and people of color experience in spaces that are predominantly white. Um, Kasha, I don't know whether you want to sort of move on and talk about this idea now of 
kind of whiteness yeah. and how that is sort of simultaneously all around us but but never acknowledged or never discussed yes so so exactly those things like what Rima was saying about microaggression you know if you're a white person going through life as a white person you will not know what it is because you don't experience that so when we think about whiteness we think of this thing that is you know something that is taken for granted it's this kind of unnamed um, political system, like Charles Mills was saying, um, who's a theorist. So it's the political system that has made the world what it is today, but we don't really speak about it. We don't really name it. But what whiteness comes with is power, is domination, is political authority. It's all those things. But somehow whiteness is never questioned, right? It is what is normal. So we say white people, we say people of color, right? So we, we don't kind of um, think of ourselves Right? Like we are neutral as white people. So we are the norm. And the problem with that is that when you set a norm, then everybody else um, needs to adjust to that norm. Right? And so whiteness becomes this universal category that sa says what is right and wrong. So when it comes to things like, you know, uh, beauty ideals, fashion tastes, food, <laughs> political systems, um, religion, whatever everybody else who are not in that category and here when, when you're speaking about whiteness we're speaking particularly about you know a certain whiteness that was sort of constructing in in, in the west um so, so so everybody else needs to sort of adjust to that right so it dictates all of these things also the way we view people as you know criminal or non-criminal dangerous or not dangerous right um and can it kind of leads us on to talking about the criminal justice system because you know, often people who get caught up in the system are racialized groups and their experience of people of color within the criminal justice system is different. It's, uh, it's uh, people of color have disproportionately big <laughs> experience and disproportionately bad experience with criminal justice system, right? So here is like where whiteness actually structures that. If you're a white person, you might not have experienced um, stop, and stop and search. If you're a black person in this country, you are what is it nine times more likely to 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 experience stop and search and you know in in some cases as we know from you know the murders of george floyd and many others before him um not only black men black women also latinos and other racialized groups in the us but also in the uk you know the murder of mark duggan for example um, and others, um, you know, sometimes it does end, you know, disproportionately for, for black young people, it ends with them being murdered. And until, uh, you know, we saw the um, trial of um, uh, Derek Chauvin who, who murdered George Floyd and he got, um, he was made guilty on all the accusations against him, but this was, a, you know, one of the few kind of cases, right? Um, so often, you know, the, the experience uh, of ethnic minorities with the police and with the larger criminal justice system is overwhelmingly negative. While for white people, it might actually be positive. When we see a police officer, we might think, oh, great, you know, we'll ask them for help. <laughs> and people of color might not feel that way, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I know um, sort of African-American academics and scholars from the US who will think twice if they're in danger of, of calling the police because they don't know whether the attentions of the police will be turned on them, not in terms of protection, but in terms of violence, uh, which is just shocking, you know. Um, yes. so, oh, sorry, go on, Kesha. No, and, and, and actually, I guess that, you know, that is not sort of unfounded, right? So if we actually look at the statistics of, say, mass incarceration, or in prisons, right, imprisonment, so, so we talk a lot about it in the US context and we, and we will do it you know, in class as well because mass incarceration is such an issue in the US in the sense that it has, imprisonment rates have really gone up in the US. So if we just think back a little bit historically to sort of 1980s, we had Ronald Reagan as president in the US. Here was um, Margaret Thatcher, they kind of liked each other. They <laughs> did some similar policies and Ronald Reagan had this policy, you know, it was called tough on crime. Right. So with that being tough on crime, he basically thought, like, let's throw people in prison. It will solve the crime problem. 
Um, what happened was that, you know, in US, the prisons expanded. With that, of course, uh, expanded also the involvement of private companies in prisons. And we call that the prison industrial complex. And you will hear that uh, when, when we start lecturing you what that is and why it's a problem. Um, but just to kind of um, cut to the statistics. So in the US, in the 1970s, sort of so before the tough on crime regulations, the population of prisoners were about sort of 350,000. And today it's about 2 million. So it's one of the most, the countries that incarcerates most people and disproportionately black people, right? Uh, but when you look to the UK, so we got, of course, lesser numbers because we're a smaller population. But proportionately, if you look per um, sort of 100,000 population, and if you, if you compare the numbers, actually, we have huge disproportionalities when it comes to our prison system. So actually, more black people are jailed proportionately in England and Wales than in the US, if you look at the sort of the numbers of, of black people in this country. So this is really a big problem. But we somehow tend to think, you know, like, let's talk about the US and let's not talk about what happens in the UK, right? Definitely. I was just uh, Googling um, an article from, from a while ago about David Cameron, who was our prime minister around 2011, I think. Um, and he was talking about at the time the all out war on gangs. So the, the idea of sort of a homegrown war against your own citizens, against ostensibly um, marginalized, uh, criminalized, already criminalized, racialized, probably economically, socioeconomically and socially excluded people who you are here to protect. Um, and to uh, to create some sort of militarized approach to dealing with that is just really shocking. And we can see how this sort of militarized approach to managing people, to managing populations that essentially was trialed out within the colonies, but now is, you know, trialed out within our prisons, with at our borders, within our schools, um, is essentially a way to uh, codify, categorize, as we were talking about before, who good students, uh, good citizens, uh, you know, good prisoners, um, prisoners worthy of re rehabilitation versus the bad and the immoral. Um, you know, th this is this is how how these systems work, and this this is how we can tie these systems together within what um, Kasha was calling the military industrial complex. So I don't know whether we want to talk a little bit about maybe bordering and immigration as an extension of this sort of militarization of of the criminal justice system. Yes, and you know this is something we also uh, will do in, in in our lectures that we will actually link you know what happens at our borders and outside to race and racism, because you know many people um, look at for example you know in the refugee crisis we look at people who are you know drowning in these boats right trying to reach Europe, um, and can't and you know few people ask sort of um, you know why are these people on boats. Well, it's probably because it's cheaper to take a boat. No, no, it's not cheaper to take a boat, actually. It's actually cheaper to fly, but they're not allowed to fly because there are some EU regulations that are stopping people from um, coming in as asylum seekers um, by plane, right? So this is the way that these, as we call racial borders work in the sense that, you know, there are desirable immigrants. You know, you can come from really further away than many, uh, uh, many refugees come. So you come from Australia, but if you're a white Australian and Australia is counted as the West, you know, it's a settler, settler colony, you will be able to just come on a plane, get off and, if, and you're fine. But uh, if you're from different countries, you know, and often these are countries that were formerly colonized by this country, by France, by other countries, um, you will have problems getting in, right? Because you are considered undesirable. And a few years ago, um, the government introduced something called the a hostile environment, right? So to make it specifically hostile for some groups of people to come to this country, work as immigrants and thrive, okay? Blocking their, their access to uh, healthcare, for example, right? So this is the way we try and think, you know, globally about this, that actually, you know, what happens uh, with race and racism here or in the US, like it actually, we need to think globally about it. Like, 
what does it mean to you know buy items here that are made by people who are unpaid in Bangladesh? Like, how do we link that to race and racism? Yeah, we should link it because it's it's kind of part of the same picture, right? Who is considered as exploitable? You know, um, who 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 is benefiting from whose labor, etc. Yeah, we can see that right now with um, sort of what people are calling vaccine apartheid um, and vaccine inequality. So, you know, which countries have surplus vaccines? Um, actually, the US, uh, I believe they're not administering the AstraZeneca vaccine at the moment, and they've got a huge amount that they could very sensibly ship to other countries where the vaccine rate is lower than 5%. And I think in the UK, for example, it's, it's way over 50% now. Um, but uh, the ways in which sort of global trade is protected um, and managed um, and like primarily for the benefit of the richer sort of Western countries like the UK and the US sort of even in these times of crisis uh, prohibits uh, the distribution of wealth, the distribution of resources. Um, and I mean, it's been happening like this time in memoriam, so we really, really shouldn't be shocked. I think what's different now, at least, is that there are social media and news media sort of outrage over the situation, particularly what's happening in India at the moment. Um, I don't know whether we want to, I mean, Kashi, you talked about the idea of having to think up and link ideas of, of race and racism globally. And I think that's incredibly important because the us and them um, sort of boundaries that are made um, through kind of machinations of whiteness between kind of white and non-white doesn't just extend to within our borders, but, but beyond that. Mm. Um, but also thinking about sort of the historical basis of what's going on so thinking globally thinking historically um yeah, and that's you know, sorry to interrupt but sometimes our students say like is this history why are we why are we hearing about historical things and actually to understand what's happening now you know if you know that history and it's actually quite interesting once you, you once you know that history and you can connect it to what happens now it's 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 um then difficult for people to you know challenge like does racism really exist if you if you are able to link it and show that continuation right totally totally and i think what's great about sociology what's great about criminology is that these will touch on and you can draw on all aspects of other disciplines um on as I like to do, a bit of maths here and there, as you saw with my graph action, um, but also uh, things to do history, absolutely, geography and demography, absolutely. I learned very quickly when I became a sociologist that a rudimentary understanding of where countries are is helpful. <laughs> um, things like uh, politics, definitely. A lot of what we do, a lot of what we talk about is politics. Um, you know, discussions about eugenics, for example, are really, really important to science, to the natural sciences, to the physical sciences. Um, yeah. All sorts of disciplines. yeah, and and also like you know linking it to activism, right? Because the the point of you being at university is is you know some of you might choose to become academics, which is great, um, but most of you might want to do something different. And so with sociology and criminology, this gives you a base to sort of you know work in local government, work in the criminal justice system, make it better, uh, work in NGOs, charities, etc. So by linking it to, you know, what happens out in the community all the time, so not only talking about theories um, that can be sometimes, you know, feel sort of disconnected. So we are talking about theories, but we're also linking it what happens on the ground. And it's really interesting stuff that happened now, for example, with um, stuff around race and racism in the criminal justice system, you know, there are calls to, for, for example, abolish prisons or defund the police and people get really shocked and they say, what do you mean? Are you going to close prisons tomorrow and you know, let everybody out? And what, what, what would we do if we defund the police? What if somebody burgles my house? Like, can I not call anybody? You know, I'll call and they'll say, sorry, we're mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but it's not like that. So actually yeah. activists, um, who work for prison abolition or defunding the police more talk about things like you know if there are social problems in this world we need to have social responses adam elliot, elliot cooper was uh, was talking about this um and he says you know like we need sort of youth workers right in schools not police officers we need to sort of approach things from a more um wholesome uh, perspective rather than just criminalizing everybody uh, from you know like youth Mm -hmm. um at schools 
So it's yeah. really interesting to see what people are doing on the ground by talking about, you know, alternatives to the criminal justice system to make it, you know, a place, um, yeah, to come up with alternatives, I guess, that work for everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of um, anti-racist activism uh, comes hand in hand with a lot of class activism as well. Um, so, you know, uh, a lot of activists now are working um, towards sort of lobbying for a universal minimum, uh, universal basic income, essentially, um, a higher minimum wage in different industries, uh, especially during the pandemic, we've seen how um, predominantly ethnic minority and low waged individuals have been propping up the country essentially and keeping things going and keeping things running. And I'm thinking about nurses particularly. Um, and there are nursing networks at, at Middlesex who've, who've also been raising awareness about these issues. And it's so important that we link um, demands for anti-racism with demands for um, you know, uh, the end of, of socioeconomic exclusion, the end of poverty, the end of gender inequality. And, and so we talk, we talk about intersectionality as well when we when we lecture race. On, on race and racism. So it's not just about race and racism, it's about how these things intersect with class, with gender, with disability, with nationality, um, with all of these other um, areas in our life, all of these other what we might call axes of oppression or axes of disadvantage. Yes, yes. And, and, and maybe this is what we should sort of end on because we're coming to half an hour but just to say maybe something about you know university and the sort of efforts around decolonizing the university which we're both involved in because you know all these conversations about institutional racism of course we are not um, exempt from that right we like all institutions have issues so so Rima you have been working on this more than me so <laughs> would, you, would you tell would you tell us what does decolonizing mean in, in the context, maybe in the larger context, yeah. but also in the context of the universe? The million dollar question. Um, I guess it's essentially turning on its head in a university context on what we think knowledge is and where it comes from and what we do with it, essentially. So if we think about universities as a place where we consume knowledge or where we produce knowledge, we really have to understand how that's, again, I'm going to use that word historically, how that's happened historically and how we're in a situation now within universities where we're still predominantly prioritizing, say, theories or understandings of the world, understandings of society, understandings of the criminal justice system, even that come from predominantly old and predominantly sort of white European um, middle class scholars uh, from you know, decades ago, but even, you know, more contemporary scholars as well. And so part of what that is, is sort of interrogating and understanding how we know what we know, where that's come from, turning it up on its head um, and looking at places of what we might call hidden knowledge or unvoiced knowledge. So um, looking at indigenous scholars, looking at scholars of color, looking at women, looking at people from, from across the world and what they've said about uh, kind of the history of the labor movement, what they've said about the history of social change and transformation, um, what they've said about global flows of sort of capital and labor um, and using that to inform sort of, I would call it a better, but definitely a more, um, uh, decolonized kind of understanding of, of, of society. Um, and there are sort of things that we can do as we go through, as people learning, as people teaching uh, these subjects. Um, and a lot of that is essentially to kind of open up um, spaces within our classrooms, within our lecture halls, within our seminar rooms, within our labs to talk about our own lived experiences. You know, we might have histories, personal histories, um, kind of long-standing ancestral histories that tie in with all of the sorts of things that we are learning, particularly when it comes to social inequality. Um, so giving a space where we can sort of talk to and talk about our own experiences is really important and tying that up within theories um, and, as I said, understandings about the world and about society from not just sort of your kind of traditional Western scholars, but from scholars and scholarship knowledge and knowledge is from all around the world um, and not presuming that there is one good way to do research or one good way to produce knowledge or think about knowledge or even speak uh, about social issues yeah. um, so yeah 
you know, house trained, you know, when I was at uni a while back now, I mean, we were, you know, we were doing sociology and we were only reading um, these, you know, Western European uh, white men, right? And so, so, you know, as a woman or as a person of color, you might think like, uh, but where are people who look like me, who are like me, who have those lived experience like me? And so we are such a diverse university. And what we want is for our students to feel, you know, to see themselves in the curriculum. And it's really, it would be really limiting if we only read those, um, you know, those small section of uh, the, the world. You know, we remember white people make up a very small minority in the world. So we should, so what we try to do is just to be more inclusive generally, right? Share our own experiences and read people who are, um, you know, diverse as, as are we. Absolutely, yeah. So I think we're ready for our Q and A now, and we have some questions in the chat. Oh, do we? Okay, let me just. So I think one is a comment, so we can draw on that first. So that's from Hamid, who has stated, um, "I think for me, when it comes to CV application, we can look at how the AI system that companies set up to filter." Act applications can be biased and continue to re remain exclusive of others at times. So that's really interesting. Kasia, do you want to talk about that sort of technology and bias within technology? I'm really bad at technology and bias within technology. <laughs> I just know it exists and I know there has been studies done. Yeah, on this. So the idea is that, okay, humans are flawed. We have our own prejudices. We have our own bias. Some people say that's natural and to some extent, it is, uh, but a lot of the time it's what we call it socialized. Um, and so the idea, I'm sure some very smart Silicon Valley types have thought, okay, so rather than sending job applications to a human being who can be like, oh no, I don't know how to pronounce this person's name. So I'm gonna put that in the no pile. We can send it to a computer, an AI system um, that can sort of filter and shortlist applications for us. Um, but these systems themselves can be biased. And one of the reasons that I've read why this happens is because they're created by humans themselves. Um, so rather than sort of outsourcing these systems to kind of technology, I would say it's very important for institutions and organizations that are hiring to sort of confront um, perhaps uh, their own hiring practices. OK, um, and, you know, unconscious bias training is is pretty much you know du jour in most institutions unconscious bias training essentially is um you know a, a click through online exercise where where you uh, talk about um how you might have different feelings uh, and different senses of affinity with people from different backgrounds um but really really going further beyond unconscious bias and thinking okay so we need to, and perhaps we want to even, which would be a good step, have a more diverse workforce. How can we do this? And what are we doing wrong at this hiring, this application stage? Okay, so really sort of not outsourcing that to um, technology per se, but to human beings and seeing how we can improve as humans being and as institutions, organizations and a society. So you might think that me and Kasia are just like up in the clouds right here, but uh, you know, you can join us, it's fun. So, so there's another question that um, I'm going to try and uh, answer it from my perspective and then ask Rima because it's a little bit of a contentious question. Uh, can you be racist to white people like reverse racism? Now, what I play in class and you will experience this when you come and join us is this clip by comedian, one of my favorite comedians, Amir Rahman. Um, it's called reverse racism. If you go on YouTube and you type Amir Rahman, reverse racism, you will get the answer that he, he will tell you in a much more funny way than I can. But basically saying that, um, no, why? Because of the history. So again, we're looking at the history, right? If we would be, uh, if there would be no unequal power relations between white people and the rest, right? All the people that are kind of not fitting into the category of whiteness, um, you would be able to say, okay, there are, we are equal, Right, so we can of course oppress each other if we're equal. But because of the long history of you know slavery, colonialism, um, you know neocolonialism, what is happening now, where you know we are extracting resources still and benefiting ourselves, I would say that it's really difficult to make the claim that there can be reverse racism when whiteness is still the dominant sort of category, where white people are still 
have so much more power, so much more resources. But Rima might disagree with me, or mm -hmm. anybody else might disagree. And feel free to write in the in the chat or in the Q and A if you disagree. So yeah. I do I do agree with you, Kasha, to some extent. Absolutely about the fact that racism, or as we define it within sociology and criminology, is it's historical. Okay, so racism just for us isn't prejudice. It's not just stereotyping. It's not just thinking bad thoughts or saying bad things about another group or another person, although that is a large part of it. There is a huge kind of historical um, socioeconomic sort of basis underneath behind that that creates the sort of structural differences that you see today between peoples of color um, and, and I might actually sort of flip the white non-white and say people of color, non-people of color, um, both within multicultural Western societies and globally as well. Um, I think it's really important to talk about how racism and racial exclusion and the way that that ties into economic exclusion, gender exclusion and so on and so forth is bad for society as a whole. And how whiteness is particularly insidious because it ties in with economic power. We know that there are plenty of people, white people, people racialized as whites, who um, are economically excluded as well. Okay, so I think the situation is a lot more complex than that. Um, but I think there is a whole nother layer, a whole nother level um, of kind of harms that whiteness uh, meets out to people of color. That means that it's really difficult to talk about sort of prejudice and negative stereotyping of white people, which I don't condone either. I don't condone any type of stereotyping, negative or positive. Um, that uh, means that, you know, I, I would not sociologically feel that talking about reverse racism is is sort of in any way justified or accurate personally. OK, but we'll, we can talk about these distinctions, obviously, in class from September. See, there's me. Yes, and unpack it. And, you know, we will disagree, of course, with you. even me and Rima will disagree with each other sometimes. And in class, we have heated debates and it's OK as long as it's, yeah. you know, nice and, um, you know, not hostile in any way, which, which it really is. Totally, totally. Safe spaces, safe spaces. Um, we've got, oh, my God, we've got so many good questions. Oh, my gosh. OK, all right. Um, shall I see if I can sort of subsume some of them together? Oh, wow, yeah, there's so many. <laughs> yeah. Um, sort of capitalism contributes to, to, to a lot of racial inequalities today. Absolutely. Race and class are what we call co-constituted. They're formed with one another. And a lot of this is, again, down to sort of economic and resource extraction during the colonies and the way that the Western powers managed, even post decolonization, to set themselves up as, you know, the the arbiters of, of global flows of capitals. They are the rich. Absolutely. Kasia, do you want to draw on that as well? Yeah, I mean, I think actually, you know, being anti-racist, I think also means you have to in some ways critique capitalism because capitalism and racism came up, you know, together. It was so interwoven, right? Like, so if we think of, you know, uh, exploitation, like when we think of slavery, I mean, that's when, you know, the countries that uh, enslaved, like, made their money. I mean, we've only literally in this country recently stopped paying compensations for slavery to the slave owners. Yes. <laughs> so, like in our lifetime, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, and with colonialism, I mean, you know, the, the, the reason why this country is so rich, I mean, sometimes it might not feel so rich, but in a global scale, it is. It is because, you know, this country extracted resources from like India, for example, that it colonized. So it built its welfare system, NHS, was built on money that was actually extracted and, you know, and, and labor that came here to build these kind of institutions. Yeah. So I, I mean, think, taxation system was trialed in India and that's been the basis of the British welfare system, you know, and it's not the same in other countries and other societies. Absolutely. So, um, Kasha, oh, shall I read out the next question to you? Um, if you focus on the historical aspect of racism in modern society being a product of colonialism and eugenics, why do these prejudice views continue? What perpetuates this? Mm. So, you know, I think that, why do they continue? I think it's about power. You know, people don't want to really give up power. And once you have tasted what it is uh, like to have that power, it's like with patriarchy, right? Like it's, it's kind of difficult to give that up. Um, but I also think it's about people 
not believing that there is sort of an institutional problem. Now, when we teach about this, you know, pretty much many of our students think that it's obvious that, you know, um, these things that, you know, Rima was talking about, the different statistics in terms of employment or health or stop and search, they are kind of institutional structural problems. But actually, if you ask, you know, your auntie or your friends, they will often say that actually, you know, it's not institutional, uh, we are post-racial, so it's just kind of individual. So if we don't believe that it is something that is a kind of part of our society, we don't think that it is our responsibility to do anything about that, because we think, you know, it's my neighbor, he's a little bit like racist, you know, but generally we're fine. So we don't really see how our everyday acts and the things that we do and even the, the wealth that we have you know, um, is because other people don't have that wealth, right? Or don't have those privileges, right? So, uh, so yeah. I think that it continues um, because of because of power and, and because of people are, are not kind of maybe educated in terms of, um, not only educated in terms of like university education, but in terms of like what our politicians say to us, you know, on a daily basis about these kind of things. Totally. And I think that, um that kind of ties in with Lauren's question, but have you noticed that students from marginalized groups tend to stray away from optional modules about race and race related issues? And I haven't really seen a pattern. We get like a really good sort of take up for, for these modules and really good discussions. Personally, as, as an ethnic minority, I still do struggle. Like I was brought up by my parents to be like, oh, you know, you're born in Britain. There's, you're, you're absolutely fine. You know, I don't even know how you can think of yourself or describe yourself as Indian. You're British and you're educated and you're doing well. And, you know, um, there's no such thing as racism. And I still struggle with that because I was socialized to believe that there wasn't really any such thing as racism. Um, but what we do, even though we want to bring in people's lived experiences into our teaching, and that is relevant, what we do in sociology and criminology, we, we learn these things from an academic perspective, from a policy perspective, from a statistical perspective, historical perspective. So what we do is, um, it's really comprehensive, okay? Um, so we want to sort of learn the theories, we wanna learn the perspectives, we wanna look at the data, we wanna critique the data and all of these sorts of things. Um, and so, you know, it's rigorous and it's interesting and it's educative and so we get take up from, from all sorts of different kinds of people. And we have all sorts of really different great discussions. About. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, Rima, like I have noticed that as well, that, you know, our university is so incredibly diverse that uh, actually like, students of color sometime, you know, in a classroom, there will be more students of color than white students. And that means that it is more comfortable because it is so diverse. So it is comfortable to speak about these things um, more so than if you're at a predominantly in a predominantly white space and you are one or two students of color. So I think that's the kind of and I have worked at other universities, so I can say this for sure that at Middlesex, that space is there and students do um, do take it up. And, and, and I have seen many students of color actually take up issues, you know, writing uh, essay questions, answering essay questions around race and racism and really sort of exploring it more. Totally. Um, there's another question we can perhaps answer quite quickly. Are there any books you can recommend on this topic? Oh, so many, but maybe like if you guys, if you guys like write, type our names in Google and find our email address, or we can maybe maybe type it up, um, we can send you, um, you know, several references. We can send you uh, documents um, uh, and, and, and ideas of books. Um, yeah. yeah. But one I, I really love and on which I have on, on one of my reading lists is um, Natives by Akala, who is a scholar and an artist and a writer. Um, and that's a really, really good book about sort of institutional racism and also his experiences growing up um, as a, a racialized minority as well. Um, oh, gosh, I've lost the I've lost the Q&A. So there's one, oh my, there's so many great questions, guys. I mean, so many great questions. Like, please come and join us. We want to talk to you. Um, so <laughs> just, just one, can there be racism in whiteness? Um, is it more like racism is historical based on the English race against everyone else? Um, so well, yeah, I think whiteness is, is really, really complex. And there are sort of what we call degrees of whiteness and groups, as Kasia said, that sort of change in terms of what we might call proximity to whiteness. And historically and even contemporarily, groups within countries, within regions globally have their own sort of hierarchies of race, their own sort of racial systems as well. 
Um, what we sort of tend to talk about when we're looking at sort of colonialism um, is uh, the racial racialized hierarchical system sort of within the, the West that sort of, I guess, affects us and affects um, the institutions and processes and systems within the UK largely. But uh, there is sort of a huge amount of complexity within this issue as well. And I think this is something that we will hopefully try to tease out uh, in this new module next year. And Rima, there is, um, there's a question that I think you would be really suited to answer. I'm just going to read it out to you. Okay. In terms of what's happening to Asian hate, that's currently happening right now, mostly in US and UK. In regards uh -huh. to people of color, they are also racist towards Asian people. What is your what is the take on that? Yeah, differential racism is, is a big issue. And again, I try to reserve racism as a term to use in a specific context, as I said before. So we might want to talk, talk about sort of differential prejudices, perhaps, but, you know, lots of scholars do talk about differential racisms, and these exist within a lot of societies. So as an Asian person in our community, we have colorisms, we've got differential racisms, we've got negative positive stereotypes, again, all very, very complex. Um, I think uh, within what's happening in terms of the UK, you know, Asian hate, anti-Asian sentiment, it really is flared up and propped up by discourses around white supremacy. So this is where whiteness is really important to discuss, okay? Um, but I think you're absolutely right, the differential racisms are sort of uh, something that, that, that is interesting and important to analyze and to discuss. A lot of that has to do though, colorisms, for example, within Asian cultures, I think there's a lot to do with colonial histories as well though. But that's yeah. a really, really good question, yeah. And there is a question, maybe we should end on this, um, and I'm sorry, we, we can't answer all, but there's a question of, um, you know, um, could you elaborate on the idea of race as a social construct? So we do that, we, we do this in class a lot, but basically just to really be brief, it's the idea that, um, you know, race is a biological category, the differences between us um, in terms of skin color are not actually so big. So actually, you know, the, 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 the thing that we, we have different sort of hair structure, different skin color, that makes up a very small part of our difference. And actually we are very, very alike as a human race. So the, the idea that you should segregate people and, and apply, you know, different characteristics just because we have different skin colors it is highly exaggerated in order to justify racism. So actually it, it can, biological differences as such are, are, are very small. It, it, Rima, do you wanna add anything to that? Um, yes, yep, absolutely. Sort of at the population level, you know, we're, we're no different genetically or biologically to people halfway across the world, you know, as we are to those within our own sort of specifically talking about kind of origin country. Um, so obviously there's there's lots of texts and lots of books about that. Um, I just want to really pick up on two questions before we finish um, about career paths and jobs with a degree mm. in criminology and books for forensic psychology and criminology. And I'm so sorry we haven't managed to get through to those, get round to those questions, but our email addresses are on the screen. So please feel free to take a note of those and email us and any of the other questions that we didn't get around to and would love to chat about that. And I think, you know, it's so great uh, to have all of these really, really interesting sort of questions um, and really sort of kind of interesting engagement with what we're saying. And this is basically a huge part of the basis of a lot of what um, our seminar work is, our small group work is in modules where we're talking about uh, race, racism and whiteness. Yeah, thank you guys so much. I mean, you have such interesting questions. Sorry we didn't get, but but as we must say, please, please email us and, and we'll we'll answer all of you. Totally. I don't know whether, um, Andre, you wanna take over? Yeah, that's it. So thank you very much, Rima and Kesha. That was really, really interesting talk. Um, I've read some of the books and looked at some of the resources you mentioned as well. And even after reading that, I still learned quite a lot from that talk. So thank you very much for sharing your extensive knowledge on topics of race and whiteness. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. Thanks um, so much. Along. Bye, guys. Bye.